。你叫什么名字啊？我叫四岁。几岁了？我四岁了。宝宝的名字叫什么？ This TikTok video from 2020 shows a then four-year-old Abdul Aziz speaking Chinese as if that is his native language. However, according to Aberdaraman Toti, a Uyghur living in Turkey for many years, the kid is his lost son whose native language is Uyghur, not Chinese. <laughs> In 2017, his wife traveled to Xinjiang to see her parents with all three of their children. That was the last time Abdurrahman saw his family. Abdurrahman is among hundreds of Uyghur parents that have lost their children to China's large-scale internment campaign to educate these children in what China calls centralized care. But Abdurrahman asserts that China is isolating these children from their Uyghur heritage as thousands of Uyghurs are being reconditioned by the Chinese government in mass internment camps. Are they trying to brainwash them? Well, these camps are only second to similar efforts done in Europe during World War II. So you decide. Welcome to Nutty History. In today's video, we're exploring the secret Uyghur internment camps run by China. In the late 2010s, a wide appeal and allegations from the Uyghur diaspora from across the globe drew the world's attention towards China's northwestern province, Xinjiang. China has a population of about 20 million Muslims and most of them live in the country's northwest region, including Xinjiang. Using Google Maps, researchers from the Australian Strategic Policy Institute and many other organizations discovered huge complexes cropping up in the deserts of western China that appear to be factories and provisional residential apartments or schools. But when you look closer, oddities start to stand out. The perimeter walls appear too high for an uncivilian construction and significant shapes protruding from these walls appear to be watchtowers, confirmed by the shadows these constructs cast in the satellite images. But why would a factory, a school, or civilian apartments require watchtowers? Because these establishments are internment camps. These camps are four-story high giant gray buildings lining up row after row in the wide expanse of dusty grounds outside cities and towns, such as Dabanchung, sprouting from the desert like a mini city of their own. According to Reuters, 39 of these camps have tripled in their size between April 2017 and August 2018, and they might have grown up to five times that number by the present time. If you ask the local Chinese Han residents of the Banchang, they would call them re-education camps. Now, while the Han are the ethnic majority of China, Uyghurs are linguistically, culturally, and geographically closer to their western neighbors, Kyrgyzstan and Uzbekistan, than the Chinese capital, Beijing. While China has made controversial claims about farther located Indian integral states touching Chinese borders as their own territory, they treat their Uyghur citizens as aliens within their own country. In 1933, Uyghurs founded their autonomous nation called the Islamic Republic of East Turkestan in Kashgar. However, the poor nation was short-lived as it was taken over within a year by Imperial China. Uyghur made another attempt to gain sovereignty in 1944 by establishing the Republic of East Turkestan closer to the Soviet Union with the backing of the USSR. But when Mao's communist forces won in 1949, the USSR not only turned a blind eye as the People's Republic of China invaded and assimilated the Republic of East Turkestan in China, but the Russians also facilitated the annexation. China has always considered Uyghurs as potentially rebellious and made strategic efforts to dilute their population in Xinjiang. Back in 1945, Uyghurs constituted 80% of Xinjiang's population, and 6% were Han Chinese. But by 2008, the numbers had drastically changed. Han Chinese had grown to constitute 39% of the Xinjiang population, and Uyghurs had shrunk down to 46%. China also neglected the Uyghurs in terms of economic and political opportunities. This allegation cultivated a series of riots in Xinjiang in 2009 that were the outcome of a Uyghur's protest for discrimination against them from higher-paying jobs. Everyone wants higher-paying jobs. These riots were the inflection point that started a crackdown on the Uyghurs. China got the opportunity to claim that their decades-long suspicions against the Uyghurs were correct after all. By 2018, one million Uyghur and Muslims from other ethnicities were possibly detained in the internment camps, as alluded to in a report presented to a United Nations committee. But China denied the allegations along with the accusation that hundreds of thousands of children of these detained minorities were also forced to boarding schools in these camps where they are being taught the Han way of living.
Abdurrahman Todi is among many Uyghurs who are now living in Turkey and claiming that China has deliberately separated them and hundreds of thousands of other parents from their children. These children are detained in boarding schools aimed to strip them of their family and their faith and language. Public records assert that in one township alone, more than 400 children were sent to boarding schools after they lost one or both parents to some form of internment. Now, China claims that these children are being educated in vocational training centers to prevent them from being lured into religious extremism. China has reportedly spent over $1.2 billion on boarding schools and kindergartens. The then China ambassador to the UK, Liu Xiaoming, however, said to the BBC that there's no separation of children. First of all, I would say there's no so-called labor camps as you describe our question. There's uh, uh, what we call vocational education and training centers. They are there for the prevention of the terrorists. In just one year, 2017, the total number of children enrolled in kindergarten in Xinjiang increased by more than half a million. And Uyghur and other minority Muslim children, government figures show, made up more than 90% of that increase. The international pressure forced China to allow press tours to these boarding schools. Yeah, okay. These tours only included observation of young adults leaning and chanting in Chinese, performing precisely choreographed dancing and music performances, and reciting rehearsed phrases in Chinese about how they have been reborn to oblige and follow the Chinese government, all while wearing a forced smile on their faces and a tracksuit jacket that eerily resembles the outfit from Squid Games. You know, that popular Korean show on Netflix that went viral during the lockdown. The Uyghur diaspora in Turkey is begging the world to have their children back. The, uh, the three children at home, do you know where they are now? Do you know who's looking after them? Ben deslat işkimi onlarda birinci ne otuz geldim Türkiye'ye gel. Mekke'ye vaktte yol işim nasıl nasıl karabet alardı. Hazır alak bulmadan kim bilmem neyle. Your husband was arrested. On beş yıllık kesildi. Bu günay ne me? Türkiye'ye git çıksız dem. These Uyghur migrants accuse the Chinese government of not only abducting their children from them, but also implementing measures to limit the Uyghur population. Many migrants, in fact, cited the forced birth rate control as a major reason why they left Xinjiang for Turkey. Now, this information falls in line with observations by Chinese scholar Adrian Zenz. The region of Xinjiang, but particularly in the Uyghur ethnic minority regions, had fallen dramatically. It declined up to 90 percent, in some cases up to 100 percent uh, between 2015 and 2018, and were declining further in 2019. I found that um, this dramatic uh, population decline is not just connected to the campaign of mass internment by where between one and two million Uyghur adults have been swept into so-called re-education camps, but I did find uh, additionally significant evidence that birth prevention, the suppression uh, of births and even mass sterilization is a systematic government policy. The state has published documents that I was able to uncover that say that those who violate birth control are punished by being put into internment campaigns, that women are facing mandatory placements of intrauterine contraceptive devices into their uterus, so-called IUDs, and for two weaker counties I uncovered uh, shocking evidence of plans for mass female sterilization uh, for 2019. He asserted that the re-education camps and separation from the family were China's attempt to whitewash their heritage and roots to convert these children into Han Chinese. According to Mr. Zin's data analysis, natural population growth in Xinjiang has declined dramatically in recent years, with growth rates falling by 84% in the two largest Uyghur prefectures between 2015 and 2018 and declining further in 2019. China became a global power after implementing an open-door economic policy in 1978, and as the Chinese economy expanded, so did its need for energy and resources. Xinjiang is an important region for China. It produces 40% of China's coal reserves and provides 20% of the country's oil, gas, and potential wind energy. Xinjiang is also the world's fifth-largest cotton-producing region, and for China, it offers millions of Uyghur, Kazakh, Tajik, and Tatar people whom the CCP have been seemingly exploiting by forcing them into cheap labor both in and out of these internment camps. The allegation is that at least 80,000 Uyghurs were transferred to various factories across China between 2017 and 2019 against their wishes.
Analysis of data contained in the police documents from 2019 to 2020 called the Xinjiang Police Files showed that almost 23,000 residents, or more than 12% of the adult population of one county, were in a camp or prison in the years 2017 and 2018. Now, if applied to Xinjiang as a whole, the figures would mean the detention of more than 1.2 million Uyghur and other Turkic minority adults. Now, even though China claims that people are treated humanely in these camps, the survivors and escapees have a whole different kind of story to tell. Xinjiang is covered by a pervasive network of surveillance, including police, checkpoints, and cameras that scan everything from number plates to individual faces. According to Human Rights Watch, police are also using a mobile app to monitor people's behavior, like how much electricity they're using and how often they use their front door. They got QR codes posted in front of people's homes to monitor their movement and people could be detained for spending too much time on the phone, suspicion of being politically active on the internet, as well as not using it enough, which could be construed as an evasion of digital surveillance. A 2018 report described internment camps in Xinjiang as thousands of guards carrying spike clubs, tear gas, and stun guns to surveil over a million detainees. The prisoners are held in buildings surrounded by razor wire and infrared cameras. Reviewed public documents showed that government agencies overseeing the camps bought 2,768 police batons, 550 electric cattle prods, 1,367 pairs of handcuffs, and 2,792 cans of pepper spray. People who managed to escape the internment camp claimed that the attempt to break out from the detainment camp was a huge risk, given that the guards are allowed to take life on sight in such a case. This woman is one of the very rare few to have escaped within the last two years. Even from a place of safety, she is visibly terrified. It's all lies. Most people are still inside. Although it looks as if everything's normal, people who were deemed a bit problematic are taken always, and no one knows where they've been taken to. They don't say anything about what happened to them when they were inside, but it's obvious that they've experienced extreme horror. In most cases, passports are confiscated from Uyghur families to prevent them from fleeing the country. Uyghurs living in Turkey and the U.S. have talked about how dangerous it is for them to contact their extended families back in Xinjiang because of the constant surveillance and the repercussions. Another reason China is seeking control over Xinjiang is the historical importance of the area. China is in the middle of a highly ambitious project called the Belt and Road Initiative, which was initiated in 2013 to revive China's trade routes in the Northwest and to revive the Silk Road of antiquity. This trillion-dollar infrastructure venture to boost China's economic and political influence around the world is investing in installing fiber optic cables and train lines and gas pipelines, along with other advanced infrastructure bells and whistles along the Silk Road routes. Tracing these projects on the map, makes it kind of obvious why Xinjiang is so vital for this project's success. Most economic corridors proposed to be developed by China pass through or begin with Xinjiang. Since the 1990s, the discourse against CCP in China have been on the rise amongst Uyghurs, and it is believed that Xi Jinping has instructed his officials to deal with them with absolutely no mercy. With 15 million Muslims in Xinjiang and neighboring provinces under surveillance and extreme scrutiny for more than a decade, there is a question looming in world diplomacy. Why are Islamic countries in the Organization of Islamic Cooperation mostly silent over the matter of Uyghurs in China? Apart from restraining, detaining, and re-educating Uyghurs, China has reportedly destroyed 8,450 mosques in Xinjiang. And yet most of the Islamic world has acted oblivious to Uyghurs' plight despite the fact that 15 other countries have strongly condemned China's actions. And not only that, the Organization for Islamic Cooperation has actively defended China's stance and repeatedly cleared them of allegations. In 2019, not only did the OIC disregard the atrocities against Uyghurs, but 28 of 51 member countries of the OIC vouched for China's claim of a clean record at the UN Commission on Human Rights. At the forefront of China's supporters are Saudi Arabia, Pakistan, and Syria, and they have provided roadblocks on a constant basis against the appeals for discussing the Uyghur situation on the international front. The reason behind such an attitude is suspected to be prioritizing economic, political, and diplomatic relationships with China. China has acquired a pivotal role in the Gulf Cooperation Council's energy markets. Uzbekistan and Kazakhstan are considered victims of the debt trap diplomacy exercised by China against them. Pakistan owed about $70 billion to China by the end of 2022, and let's be honest here, there is no easy way for them in the near future to get rid of that debt. The Chinese-Pakistan Economic Corridor has become a huge burden on Pakistan and they are very close to defaulting on their loans. State-run Chinese firms have been acquiring assets in Pakistan, forcing the country to act as China's puppet on the world stage. 
Meanwhile, Saudi Arabia, despite being rich, knows how profitable a friendship with China is, both economically and diplomatically. In June 2023, over 30 officials from 16 Arab countries visited Xinjiang. Their response, after probably visiting the camps, was to endorse and praise China's efforts against extremism. Thanks for watching Nutty History. Like and share to show support for our efforts, and subscribe to our channel to watch more videos like this one.